The intake manifold is a critical part of any performance mode. But what happens if they don't make a lot of intakes for your combination? No problem. Make it yourself. This video is less about designing an intake manifold than it is about finding out what works. One of the critical elements in intake design is the runner length. And the best way to find out what runner length works for your combination is to test it. And the best way to test it is to design an adjustable prototype intake. That way you can adjust the runner length and find out what works for your combination. You can then apply all that information to the finished product. Let's take a look at two examples where I did just that. Sometimes when you build a custom intake, it's out of necessity. And that was the case on this 1996 4.6 liter four valve Cobra motor. It, there was not a lot of available options for that B headed combination. So what I did was put together an adjustable intake so I could find out what the thing wanted and see if I could make some more power. We put together, this was basically a used motor that I borrowed from John Mahovitz over at Acufab. We did put some comp uh, extreme energy, the XE262AH cams, mild four valve cams, they work pretty well. And this thing was equipped with the factory intake, but we did remove the Emmerich plates on the 96 combination. So equipped like that with long tube headers and the fast management system and 36 pound injectors, this early Cobra motor produced 376 horsepower and 344 foot-pounds of torque. So here's what happened when we installed the first of our many adjustable <laughs> intake runner lengths. So obviously you can see this one was very long and picked up a ton of torque down here, down to 3,500. Did pick up power at the top as well. The peak power was up to 391 horsepower, but take a look and see what happened past 6,500. It started to make less power than the, that factory intake, and the factory intake would have continued to carry that if you would have, if you wanted to rev that thing. But the nice thing is this thing, you know, from down below 3,000 RPM all the way to 6,500 RPM, this combination would have been very effective. I mean, it certainly would have outran the factory one because down here at 3,500 or 3,600 RPM, we went from 302 foot-pounds to 366 foot-pounds. So you can imagine what an extra <laughs> 60 plus foot-pounds of torque would be like on a 4.6 or 4 valve. I mean, that would definitely be beneficial. So now let's take a look and see when we shorten the intake runner length just a little bit from that, a couple of, a couple of inches here. And we started to pick up power a little bit more at the top. We still had fairly good gains down here at the bottom. We picked up from 320 to 360, so still 40 foot-pounds of torque there, which was really nice. But we picked up more power, and had we revved it this even higher, we probably would have continued to do that. Our peak power was up to 396 horsepower, so that's another good combination. This becomes the difficulty, is choosing which one of these intake combinations you want if you're going to finally make one. So here's what happened when we shortened it even more. This was also a good combination. Uh, you know, good solid gain throughout the whole curve. Peak power curve early, about 6,000 RPM. 387 foot-pounds of torque. The thing is, we should have revved this farther because we would have saw the sine wave continue. It was actually starting to climb again at 7,000 RPM. And I don't think we found our power peak with this particular combination. I think it probably wanted to come up again. It would have been nice to rev it a little bit higher than that. Here's what happened when we tried our final shortest runner combination. You can see um, we got big power out here at the top, you know, nice from 5,700 RPM on out. We put produce over 400 horsepower, 407 horsepower, and managed to produce near what the factory one did. But look at this big dip here down in, down in the middle um, from 4,700 out to 5,700. We dropped down below that factory intake manifold, and as we saw, we'll see in the... Um, in the other four valve, the later version, this was kind of a common area right here for the factory intake manifold. It works pretty well right in that area. So what they did, they obviously did their homework. But this is the thing. Now, which one do which one of these do you choose? <laughs> do you choose the high RPM piece with all this extra power out at the top? Do you choose one of the combinations in the middle? And that becomes a thing when you're testing all these intake runner lengths. It's hard to choose which one you want. The obvious combination would be to have an adjustable manifold that <laughs> adjusts while you're running so you can have the best of everything but sometimes that's not possible let's check out our next combination 
This test was run on another 4.6 liter 4 valve, this one the later version. And this test motor actually came from Sean Highland. It was a 10 to 1 Cobra motor, 4.6 liter 4 valve, with stage 1 cams. And then we equipped it with the factory 2001 4 valve intake manifold and throttle body. This combination was also run with hooker long tube headers, a fast XFI management system, and I think we had 36 pound injectors in this thing, and it ran pretty nice. This was actually part of a big intake manifold shootout that I did on this 4.6 liter 4 valve. We ran a number of different intakes on this, including different variations on this adjustable intake manifold. So to get things started, we ran the baseline with the factory intake, and kind of compared to that, because as we'll find out, the factory intake on this 4.6 liter 4 valve is actually a pretty good piece especially for you know power production down below 6500 rpm so equipped with the factory intake our 4.6 liter 4 valve from sean highland with the stage one cams produced 408 horsepower and 383 foot pounds of torque so now what i did was install the adjustable intake manifold and it allowed us to change the different the different runner lengths as before so here's what happened when we put the longest runner intake now I'll run with that intake combination. Our 4.6 liter 4 valve produced 416 horsepower, but only 372 foot-pounds of torque. And as you can see, the adjustable manifold is in red here. It did indeed make peak power, but it made peak power a little bit sooner by two or three hundred RPM. But torque was actually down compared to the factory manifold. Now they put an awful, lot, an awful lot of work into that factory manifold and it works really well. I mean they were playing with obviously more than just intake runner length and they didn't have um, fixed diameter aluminum tubing <laughs> to work with. They probably had taper and other things that they were doing on the manifold because they know how to design manifolds. They did a pretty good job. But the nice thing about the adjustable manifold is I didn't have to just run one runner length. So what we did then was shorten the runner length by a couple of inches and as you can see shortening the runner length dramatically improved power production out at the top peak power was up to 424 horsepower but we did lose just a touch more torque down low peak torque was 369 foot-pounds of torque but good gains on the um, shorter runner past like 5,500 RPM. So if you're wanting more, you know, kind of on the top end, shorter runners, as we always see, tend to make more power. But if you see the factory intake has this big like torque bulge here kind of right in the middle, and that's a, that's a good piece. So here's what happened when we shortened it even more. We took another about three inches of runner length out of it. And as expected, we picked up a, quite a bit more power out at the top. Peak power checked in at 436 horsepower. And as you can see from 6400 on out, I mean, it made more power than the longer runner did and made quite a bit more power than the factory manifold from 6000 on out. But take a look at this. Look at the big hit in torque that it had in the 5000 to 5500 RPM range. I mean, it was, um, it was dramatic. The peak torque actually occurred way down here at 44 4600 rpm and that's the thing you'll see with changing the runner length it actually produces a sine wave and <laughs> you'll see we got our second part of the sine wave way out here but it didn't make as much torque as it did down low so this is kind of this is what to look for when you're changing the runner length in an intake manifold and why it's nice to be able to adjust that and change the runner length because you could find out if you if you just made this shortest runner length and said, oh yeah, we made a bunch of peak power, but it's pretty soft down low, you wouldn't know that maybe if we adjusted it just a little bit, we might lose a little bit of top end, but we'd pick up 30 or <laughs> 30 or so foot pounds of torque. So then you have to figure out what is the best combination. You always have to trade off one for the other when you're adjusting runner length, and that's just part of the design. But once you hone in on what you need for the runner length, you then can start playing with other things. You can start playing with taper and radius entries and, and even plenum volume and stuff to try to optimize that particular runner length. 
Now let's get to our conclusion. Okay guys, let me know what you think about the adjustable intake manifold approach. Now this is something I've been doing for years. In fact, I did my first one for a five liter Ford way back in the early 90s. And I've done it for a number of different engine families. I've done the two valve and three valve modular Ford. I've also done the cathedral port, the LS3 and LS7 stuff. I've done Hemi stuff. I mean, you name it. I've done a ton of these intake manifolds because it's the easiest way to do it. And I love seeing the difference. I love adjusting the runner length and finding out what happens to the power curve because it's kind of cool. I also like doing it with stack injection because that's even a lot easier. But what do you guys think? The problem here is not so much does this work because we know it does. The question is, which one do you choose? The problem is when you do this kind of thing and you start adjusting the runner length and you change the power curve, the hard part then is picking which one of those power curves that you want. It's the same thing with camshafts. When I do two different camshafts and one makes more power down low and one makes more power at the top and we see the same thing with the intake manifold, the hard part is choosing which one you want because you're always trading off something for the other. Now the ideal situation obviously is to have everything on a camshaft. If you have VTEC, if you have two different cam loads, if you have variable cam, that's kind of a nice deal. And it's the same thing with an intake manifold. If you have an adjustable intake manifold that self-adjusts while it runs, or at least has two different runner lengths and switches between them, that's kind of an awesome thing. But ultimately, in this kind of test, you're gonna have to choose. What do you want? Do you want all the top end power of a short runner intake? Do you want all the bottom end power of a long runner intake? Do you want some sort of compromise in between? Ultimately, it's up to you. I'm Richard Holder, guys. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, and I'll have more testing on adjustable intakes coming up.